Awesome. So what, uh, what we'll do is I'll, uh, I'll do a little intro of yourself and then we'll kind of take it from there, man. Okay. You ready to roll? Yeah. Um, are there people in the waiting room or are we still just chilling? Uh, we're chilling. Hmm. Do, is there an Albert that you know? There you go. Can you admit him or do I have to admit him? Sure. I can admit him. Yeah. Just cause I, the laptop's like far away from me. Sure. Excellent. You, uh, you ready to roll, man? Yeah. I mean, do you want to start at five o'clock sharp or you want to get a couple more? What are you thinking? Let's uh, yeah, we can start and then let's, uh, let's have roll people roll in here. Okay. Cool, man. I'm just going to do a quick intro of myself and then yourself, and then we can, uh, we can get going here. Okay. <clears throat> just one second. <sighs> Maybe we could turn off the waiting room. What do you think of that? Coming on now. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us right now. Uh, today, we've got a very, very special treat. One of my favorite people. We've got Ryan from SoCal, or Slay Day SoCal. What's going on, Ryan? How you doing, sir? Not Thanks too bad, having, man. I appreciate, I appreciate it very much. Absolutely, absolutely, man. Let's uh, let's give a little while before uh, people roll in here. But uh, what have you been up to during this uh, whole quarantine deal? Well, I uh, I've been enjoying you know spending time with my wife and my kids because you know I I'm a I work for public education. Usually I'm gone for 10, 12 hours a day, so I've been able to work from home a little bit. Just being able to hang out with my kids that that's probably been the biggest benefit for me man excellent. excellent that's awesome we do have a couple other guests here we've got albert and eddie as well right on i don't i don't see their faces but i know they're here man. <laughs> awesome todd from tb metal arts uh saying what's up what's going on todd how are you awesome awesome well, anyway, Ryan, I know, uh, you know, you and I, we kind of go back not too, not too long ago. We, uh, we first met really kind of at the King of the Harbors tournament uh, back in October, right? That was the first time we actually met, Matt. Yeah. 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 It, <laughs> it uh, you know, it's, honestly, October seems like super, super long ago. Then again. <laughs> it was. No, I'm just, I'm just excited to be able to contribute to, to CCA, you know, the way, what you guys, what you guys are doing for all of us anglers, like, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us don't know what your behind the scenes work does for us as the fishing community. So, I mean, hopefully when we get some more heads in here and we only got, you know, two other guys, but at least maybe you could talk a little bit about what the CCA does before we dip into it, but you know, maybe mid presentation, I don't know. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, honestly, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, CCA Cal, we, uh, we're a fishing advocacy group. We fight for your right to fish here in California. Um, we do all kinds of uh, work on the artificial reefs along with the, uh, with, uh, the hatchery programs as well. But ultimately, we're, we're the fishing advocacy group here. Uh, we fight for your right to fish here in California. And, um, and yeah, that, that's the basis of what we do. But uh, Ryan, I know uh, you've, been, uh, you've been quite hold on here so i know you've been uh you've been oh sorry i know you're super passionate about uh, the lobster fishery right there go ahead and uh let's get going on this lobster what what can you tell us in the late season and uh yeah just share share your knowledge man sure yeah that's rock and roll so for those of you guys that are that are tuned in right now i i, I greatly greatly really thank you guys for being here uh, whether you're here to get a little bit more information about lobster hooping, about the California spotted lobster, or you're here to hear some about the rockfish regulations, I thank you for being here. You know, this, we're one big community and we're all about sharing knowledge and sharing the love and, you know, we're not here to profit off this, but I can tell you that kind of against popular belief, the end of the California spiny lobster season here in California is actually the best part of the season. 
Uh, here in our temperate waters, where our waters range from like 53 to 75 degrees, these cooler water temperatures that we have in January, February, and early March, uh, the lobsters, they come in the shallows and their, their spawning cycle is a, is a shallow water spawning cycle. Um, and we're talking shallow water, like five to 20 feet, like really shallow waters. And so one of the reasons why I think CCA and us decided to postpone putting this on is because we are right now in the best part of the season. So we've got a lot of feedback from hundreds of anglers that, you know, October through December wasn't that productive locally. Uh, a lot of guys were getting, you know, 90, 95% shorts out of Dana Point. The crawling around uh, Newport was very limited to certain rock structures. The majority of bug, of bug guys that bug within Long Beach Harbor have really been struggling getting the numbers. But it's been increasing, I would say, over the past two weeks. And we'll probably see like a super strong end of the season for those of you guys that want to go drop your hoops during February and March. Because I think uh, I want to say March 17th is the last day. So it gives us about about 40 days left to bug, which is plenty of time. So now now is the time. Um, today, for those of you guys that are here, we're going to be going over uh, some lobster basics and then some more advanced techniques. Uh, there's five or six different objectives, different categories that we're going to hammer out tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about the legal aspect of bugging and the go ID and the labeling and the lobster card and all that stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about the equipment. We're going to talk about the best bait, attractants that are on the market. We're going to talk about the difference between hooping from a kayak and a boat and then hooping from jetties and piers and private docks. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what conditions to look for and how they can greatly affect lobster hooping here in SoCal. And then we're gonna finish up talking about um, a really cool feature on an app out there uh, called Navionics. And then we're gonna finish up with just a couple minutes about the regulation change, uh, changes for um, ground fishing here in the Southern management area. So everything that we're gonna talk about today, um, you know, I see a couple of heads that have tuned in. Everything we're gonna talk about is gonna be related to the Southern management zone. So we're talking, you know, Point Conception, which is kind of right around Gaviota area, um, kind of like Lompoc area, all the way down south to the Mexican border. That's the, that's the zone that we're in. So anyone that's north of Gaviota, uh, some of this will be pertinent, but most of it, most lobster hooping is done Conception and down. So um, I don't, um, you know, I see Albert and Eddie, and server one have logged in and Chris, you know, I'd like to treat tonight kind of like a, like a conversation. I'm a big talking head that, that talks and spits a lot, but if, if you have any questions or you want me to clarify something, or if you have a question for Chris, or if you want to refute me on something and talk about something else you learned, then interrupt me, you know, just take yourself off mute and say, excuse me, Ryan, I'm gonna jump in and I, I would love to have you participate. So, um, you know, we only got a couple of heads in here, but it is being recorded for those of you guys. Um, that watches at a later date. Uh, we'll probably upload it to our YouTube, our Vimeo, our website. I know CCA, Chris is going to publish it on their stuff. So we'll, this will be archived. So you want to jump into things, Chris? Yeah, let's go ahead, man. Okay, right on. So uh, one of the first things that we're going to talk about right now is we are going to focus on the legal aspect of hooping in Southern California. The majority of guys that are hoop netting are hooping from boats kayaks but there's a huge population of anglers who are going to the local piers going to some of the jetties dropping their hoops out and they're two different worlds so i'm going to first of all i'm going to present the legal side of things when you are hoop netting from a boat and so one of the biggest things to pay attention to is your lobster report card um i'm going to change my view real quick here so i can it's like a cvs oh, receipt those, what's up it's like a cvs receipt Oh, dude, it's totally CBS, Walgreens, whatever. But both of these colors uh, are our lobster report cards here in California. The colors kind of uh, correlate with whether or not you bought uh, a license at the time or you just bought the card. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They all have the same exact information. And probably the biggest thing to point out is that very first number on top called your Go ID. This Go ID is unique to every single out of state or in state angler and it stays with you your entire life. So the Go ID that you have right now is the same Go ID you're gonna have when you're 88 years old, you know, fishing for stock trout in, in your wheelchair. So 
that go ID is unique because when you are hoop netting from a kayak, uh, the crazy guys that hoop net from like boat tubes with like boogie boards and stuff, and then those from boats, you have to label your floats, your surface floats with your go ID. Uh, in this case, on this surface float, I have two IDs on here. I have myself and my son uh, in California. If you are uh, hooping alone on a vessel, uh, you're limited to five hoops. But if you're hooping with two or more people, any vessel, the maximum you can have is 10. And every single one of those floats has to be labeled with your Go ID. If Department of Fish and Game were to come across uh, uh, a hoop net and pull it up and see that it's not labeled, if they find the owner of that, they actually have the right to confiscate all of your gear and give you fines. And so what we do is we just take our floats because our, our lobster equipment is used by lots of people. We just put masking tape on it. And we just relabel them. You got to do that. You don't have to label anything if you're from a pier or from a jetty. This is only for vessel-based anglers. In addition to the Go ID that's on your report card, it's also really important to take a look at the actual documentation, um, the actual report card of things, because there are five different areas that get filled out on your report card. You have your month and your day, which is obvious. You have your location code, your gear code, and how many lobster you retain from that spot. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but when you're on your way to go hoop netting for the night, if, you're, if your cages are ready to roll on the boat and you're stocking with bait and you're cracking beers and you're happy and you're, you have to have your lobster report card filled out before you even drop those hoops. So you wanna find out your location. Here in Southern California, the locations, I mean, I think there's like a hundred on here. We focus mostly on location codes from about 50 to 60, kind of in the LA County area. Um, and then depending on the hoop nets that you're using for the evening, you either have your conical or your rigid ones that have the cross beams, or you have your lay flat hoops that are just a hoop on top of a hoop that lay flat. And those two gear codes are different. Um, these have to be filled out before you drop your hoops. And if you change location throughout the evening, you actually have to change your location code also. And you got to fill out how many lobsters you retained every single time. It's really critical that everybody on the boat does this. There's a question that gets asked a lot about, well, what if we have someone on the boat that's not helping? Do they have to have a lobster card? Well, the legal answer is no, but the definition of helping is super broad. If you're going to have someone on the boat while you're lobster hooping, they cannot drive, they cannot hold the light, they cannot do anything with bait, they can't touch the hoops, they can't be involved in any way at all. If they are involved in some way, they have to have a lobster card if they're 16 years old or older. And that lobster card is like 10 bucks a year, so it's totally worth it and not having an on the water argument with the Department of Fish and Game Warden. Um, if you have youth with you under the age of 15, they don't have to have a lobster card. They can help out all night, but they can't retain and they can't take home any lobsters at all. So if you and your three kids go fishing and you don't get them cards, you're only taking home seven lobster. But if you get each one of your little ones a card, you know, you can take seven per angler, even if they're only three years old. I got a three-year-old and I have a six-year-old and they both have their cards. So I know that's a confusing uh, talking point, but that's how it is black and white. If anyone tells you otherwise, unfortunately it's wrong. So spend the 10 bucks, get the card um, and save yourself fines and confiscation of your gear. In addition to talking about the, the Go ID side of things, I also wanna talk about the fact that your measuring tool. Your measuring tool, however many anglers you have on the boat, you have to have that many measuring tools. And these measuring tools, this one happens to be for Promar. One side is lobster, one side is crab. Lobsters are three and a quarter. There's some really rad ones that are, I'm gonna knit server again. Some hey, really awesome ones that are, we that do are have a question. By fishing supply, but you have to have one for everybody on the boat, have to. Hey, Ryan, we did have a question from Albert. Uh, where can I get my lobster report card? So your lobster report card can be purchased at any spot you've got your fishing license. I always recommend Walmart, Turner's, Bass Pro Shop, any tackle shop that, that uh, LP Fishing Supply, any tackle shop that has the ability to give a fishing license has the ability to give a lobster card. 
I go to Walmart, I go to Turner's, those are my two spots, but um, anyone, anywhere that sells a, uh, a fishing license. So uh, in addition to these measuring tools, um, there, the other legal aspect of things is the whole two hour limit. A lot of people don't know this, but when you're hooping in the Southern management area, you have to physically check your traps every two hours. If your trap has been unchecked for more than two hours, technically a warden is allowed to confiscate the gear. I recommend that hoop nets be checked anywhere from 20 minutes to 40 minutes. So it's never an issue for us, but some guys like to long soak their hoops two hours. That's the legal maximum that you can leave a hoop unattended. So those are just some legal aspects that I wanted to throw at you. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the presentation about that, just let me know. I was just about to ask, is there yeah. any, any advantage of checking your gear multiple times an hour or whatnot? So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm an advocate of checking gear every 20 or 30 minutes. And the reason why we do that is because the ability of lobsters to crawl right out. So, you know, there, there's two different hoop nets that most of us in Southern California are using. There's the conical rigid ones that stand that when they lay flat on the ground, they have that 12 inch rise. And when the lobsters crawl in here, you know, they're, they're, they're less apt to walk out. But for a lot of anglers that are using the lay flats, if they've got their fill and if they're no longer eating or they've been spooked by an octopus or a predator or a sheep head or something, they're leaving that thing. The more often you check it, the more likely you are to retain the catches that are in there. If you're pulling your traps up, and you collect the lobsters, a legal lobster out of the track, drop it right back down. Just because you only have one or two crawlers in there doesn't mean there's a lot of other lobsters on the nest. Lobsters, I'm not saying they work in herd, but they're, they have a herd-like mentality. And when there's something that's dying or decomposing and one or two of them go check it out, slowly but surely multiple lobsters are gonna go check those out. So we recommend checking traps 20 to 40 minutes. We don't let anything soak longer than 40 or 45 minutes. Hope that answers your question, Chris. Excellent. And uh, Carrie has a question. Are the cards valid for the season or for a calendar year, like a fishing license? And do you need a fishing license in addition to the lobster card? So in California, we don't have annual uh, fishing licenses. As you know, no matter where you, no matter what time you buy them during the year, they're only valid for that year. So a fishing license is good January 1st to December 31st of that year. Lobster cards are good for the entire season. So in this case for 2020, 2021, the lobster card, no matter where you buy it or when you buy it, it's valid from October, 2020 till the close on March 17th. So it's good for that window. Um, it's If you are hooping for the night and you don't have any uh, angling or hook and reel, hook and line gear on board, you don't have to have a lot uh, fishing license. If you only have lobster gear and there's no rods and reels, you don't have to have one. But most hooping guys and gals are out there sabiking up some mackerel, maybe fishing for bass, fishing for a local fish. So those are the guys that have a boat. But you don't need the fishing license if you're only hoop netting for the night. Hope that, hope that clears that up. Um, the next section we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the equipment. And we're going to start talking about uh, the bait cages that are used. Uh, here in Southern California, basically we break them down into four categories, all right? We have the kind of the old school thin wire bait cages. These are real popular. They come with the Promar series. They come with some of the Danielson series. Uh, they have almost 100% dispersion. You can see that the majority of the surface area is exposed, so you're gonna get the most set dispersion out of these. Then you have something created very similar, but these are created by LP Fishing Supply by a good friend of mine, Jeff, the owner. And these are thick wire cages that have been coated with a rubber. And these are a little bit more steel proof. One of the reasons why I prefer a coated cage over a classic thin wire cage is because of the steel lines. If you are a coastal hoop netter, especially for those of us that hoop net in San Diego or Mission or Long Beach or San Pedro, there are sea lions all over the place. And sea lions don't necessarily use their sense of smell for finding prey. Their vision is insane. And if they see a floating float on the surface and they drop down 
they're going to try to rip your cage to shreds. I've seen these metal cages just get completely demolished. Even myself right now, I'm going to pull it about 50%. That cage is done. Imagine what a sea lion jaw that's got like 800 foot pounds of strength can do to a bait cage. So that's why we promote these ones here by Jeff and LP because they're less likely to be ripped to shreds. Even more less likely to be ripped to shreds are these two products by Promar and a company called Roach Coach. The Promar seal proof cages are awesome because you can stuff your bait in there. There's a whole lot of scent dispersion, port, uh, scent dispersion ports. It gets locked in. These get locked into the bottom of your hoop. And these are really difficult for sea lions to open, but they still open and they're white. And you gotta remember, I said that sea lions rely on their sense of sight. So if you're diving down to your hoop, and they see something white sticking out as opposed to something completely darked out, what do you think they're gonna go for? They're gonna go for the white. We are really, really, really partial to these roach coaches, all right? There's like five reasons. Number one, they're locking. So once you stuff your bait inside your cage, they are unable to be opened at all. I can't do it, sea lion's not gonna do it. You actually have to depress these little buttons on both sides to slide them open. So that's one of the reasons you like them. Number two, they float. This is made out of PVC. This gets dropped in the water. They're not going down to the bottom. They're standing towards the surface. That's awesome. One of the third things we like about them is that there's two different dispersion levels. There's a 100% dispersion level where all of the ports are completely exposed. And then if you flip over the roach coach, there's a 50% dispersion level, uh, level. This is for guys that maybe like to use salmon heads uh, use some like older bait, let them sit down there for an hour or so. But for those aggressive hoop netters that are checking every 20 or 30 minutes, that full dispersion is awesome. Hey, Ryan. Can't that's enough how much these aluminum carabiners are much, much more effective than, you know, I grew up just zip tying in mine. But these aluminum carabiners, they don't rust. They clip into the bottom of your hoop nets really easily. And, um, just, you know, they're, they're not, it's not going to take you forever to get out your pair of dikes and cut out your zip ties. These are super user friendly. Hey, Ryan, just a couple, a uh, couple things here. Speaking of LP, Jeff's in the house. What's going on, Jeff? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes, sir. Also, um, Wayne brings up a good point. We are uh, actually sponsoring a 365 license bill this year in Ooh. 2021. So we are working on that. That's one of our top initiatives here. Um, David also wants to know, where can we buy the Roach Coach? So Roach Coaches, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote my guy, Jeff, <laughs> out of LP Lobster Port. But I do know that Roach Coaches, um, I'm pretty sure the product's on Amazon now. Uh, I wish Rick and his team were on here, but I know that there's a lot of local tackle shops that do carry these. I know um, LA Fishing Alliance over in the San Pedro area has them. I know that Big Fish and Seal Beach has them. I know a lot of the San Diego guys has them, but... We pick them up from a uh, lobster port fishing supply over in the Oceanside area. Um, they're absolutely worth it. As a matter of fact, for those of you guys that are hanging out tonight, we're actually giving away a full hoop setup. And in there, you get one of the brand new roach coaches. So that's where you can find those. Absolutely. And what's, uh, what's the retail on that? Uh, I believe they are $13.99, $14.99. So if you outfit yourself a whole set of 10, you're looking at about 150 bucks. Um, contact Rick, though. Uh, one of the creators of Roach Coach and let them know you want to buy a full set and let them know that uh, you heard about it, you know, on the Slay Day presentation. Guarantee he'll give you a little something, something. So, excellent, excellent. Um, so I want to talk a little bit right now uh, about the setups that are pretty much the most productive, the most effective here in Southern California. And I'm going to start off with talking about why we go with the rigid conical ones as opposed to the lay flat ones that lay flat on the ground. And it really comes down to catch retention. So if you think about the way that a hoop net lays on the ground, all right, this is the setup you got on the seafloor. All right, you got your bait cage inside, you got this laying flat, your lobsters crawl up, they fall in, they start feeding on your bait. When they fall in here, if they have a predator that comes by, or if there's a really nasty current that's like ripping everything by, they're more likely to stay inside these rigid conical uh, hoop nets. They have the protection with these crossbars that allow them to kind of shove in there as if it's like a rock structure that they're under. 
um, they have a smaller opening for them to crawl out of. But a lay flat, if that sits on the ground, that's literally a flat surface. The lobsters can walk right up and walk right out. If a big sheephead comes by or a big sea lion or another predatory lobster to feed on a small lobster, they're more likely to shoot out of there because I don't know if you know, but lobster have this propulsion system where they, they basically convulse their bodies and they can be out of your group within seconds. So we recommend these ambush theory from Promar. They come in two different sizes and they also come in an extra heavy model for those of you guys that don't want to weigh down your hoops. Um, every single hoop net, whether it's a rigid or a lay flat, is going to have your standard, standard bridle, right, which connects the three different lines to the top of your hoop net, followed by, we like to use these commercial grade ropes. They're, I believe they're 5 16 inch. Um, we set our hoops up with 100 feet of line, and then we take our extra line and we zip time up so that we can make our depths, we can make the hoop nets kind of unique to the depth. So if you're dropping it like 15 feet, 20 feet, you don't want a hundred feet of line out there. So what we do is we take our hoops, we set ours to about 40 feet of line between the hoop and between the float. And then all of your tag line, we wrap them up and we put about a pound of lead on them. Uh, there are some other products made by Promar and some other companies that are these little clip-on metal weights that bring your extra line down. We just use older 12 to 16 ounce torpedoes so that when this surface float is on the top, you have all your extra line being brought down and your extra line and your line going to your hoop net are parallel. And it makes everything a lot easier when you're pulling up on your gap to pull this and you're not gonna have your float, you know, 50, 60 feet away from the top of your hoop net. Um, on your actual float, we already talked about the go IDs that have to be labeled on there. But we, uh, we like to bore all of our floats here. I think it's a 5 8 inch. It fits the uh, Promar flashing strobe lights perfectly in there. And there's also uh, the classic 6 inch breakable ones. But we also like to counterweight our floats. So you can see that our little flat, um, 5 8 hole for the floats on top. And then underneath, we counterweight ours with uh, galvanized and fishing weights so that this sits on the surface and that beacon is just right on the surface and it's not going to fall over or have this turn upside down. So this is our typical setup we use here in Southern California. Super effective using the zip tie system. You can adjust your hoops from, you know, 15 feet all the way up to sometimes we're dropping like 200, 250 feet. So Excellent. that's your setup. Uh, anyone, anyone checking out the seminar have any questions about a typical uh, hoop netting setup? So uh, we do have a couple questions here. Todd from TB Metal Art wants to know, I'm assuming that this is about roach coaches. Do they come in smaller sizes? So the roach coaches only come in this one size. Uh, these roach coaches fit about two salmon heads, butterfly really well. They fit about four or five mackerel really well. They only come in one size. However, these wired bait cages from LP, he custom makes these. I know there's a lot of guys down in Oceanside and some of the guys that do a lot of shallow hooping in, Long in uh, San Diego, and I, they make these, and they're only like four inches by four inches. I've seen these made to like little, almost like twinky looking designs. I've seen a lot of guys make their own PVC tubes out of three and four inch tubes from Home Depot, and they you know, make them 12, 16, 18 inches. But the roach coaches only come in that eight by eight. Excellent. And uh, speaking of LP, they, Jeff says that they are stocked on roach coaches. So that's good. <laughs> uh, also, uh, Jim wants to know, do you rent hoop nets out with the boat? What is your favorite bait? What is my favorite what? Bait. Bait. Oh, well, he's jumping ahead in my agenda. But the cool thing about our company, whenever you take out one of our boats for either our twilight uh, hoop netting rental or our overnight rental, we provide everything. We have a really good relationship with Promar and Bite On Attractant and Roach Coach and LP Fishing, and we supply everything. So if you take out one of our boats for the evening with your buddies, you're given 10 rigid Promar Ambush Series hoop. You're given all of your line, your floats, your, uh, we provide 10 LED Promar lights, all of your bait, all Roach Coaches, all of your measuring devices, 
your spotlight, it's all provided. And we recommend, I'm gonna jump ahead and talk about bait. We really, really recommend fresh sardines and fresh mackerel. We've used salmon heads, we've used old frozen sardines and frozen mackerel, but the absolute best bait is fresh sardines and mackerel. And there's two different ways to get them. I recommend that you head to the bait barge before you head out for the night and get yourself a scoop from the bait barge. It's gonna cost you about 40 bucks. But what I really recommend is this product that's made by Promar, and this is their sabiki stick. So what's unique about their sabiki stick, and these things are only like 50, 60 bucks, it is a, I think it's a six foot 10 or a seven foot really stout rod that breaks down into three different pieces. But what's really cool about these sabiki sticks, you can hook it up to a spinning or conventional reel and your line actually goes inside the rod. And if you look here at the edge of the sabiki rod, you can see that the line stays inside the entire time. So I know a lot of you guys tie on your sabiki setup, jig out there for fresh mackerel. And then at the end of the night, you wanna use that setup again for some of the type of fishing. So you cut off your sabiki rig and you ditch it. In this case, you can just keep this rig on your boat or with your gear and it's a sabiki rig all the time. All you do is drop that line back down and uh, fresh mackerel is the way to go. Excellent. Albert uh, has a question there. Um, thanks for putting this on getting great information. I'm a total noob refurbishing a boat and won't be able to finish before the end of the season. Can you recommend any local lobster party boats to San Pedro? Yeah, uh, I can recommend two boats. Uh, when you use the word party, I'm going to assume he means kind of like an open sport boat, buy your own ticket. Um, the ones that I recommend are the Gale Force and the Triton. They both operate out of LA County. They have these cool little packages where you get to go fish the whole evening, sometimes local, sometimes they head over to Cap. Um, everyone kind of gathers on the deck. They pull up their hoops all night long. Everyone's hooting and hollering. They've had limits for everybody on the boat before, but everybody's also fishing. Um, so I recommend the Triton and the Gale Force. And if you just Google the words, Triton Lobster Party or Gale Force Lobster Party, it'll pop up. They'll be running until March 17th. Otherwise, if you're looking for a private charter, there are a couple companies we recommend if you want to take out three, four, five guys. We love Captain Ben Alexander and Captain Drew uh, with Natalie Ann Sport Fishing out of Rainbow Harbor and Long Beach Harbor. And we also like to kind of send people down south to San Diego to Brandon and the team over at Bite Sport Fishing. And at a Newport Balboa, we recommend private parties with Pelagic Patrol, and they're uh, they're at a Newport Balboa. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Todd wants to know, how much weight do you attach to the bottom of the hoop? So we, because we, we hoop net shallow, we don't add any weight to these hoops. I think they're five or six pounds standard, um, but they also, they offer their extra heavies, I think bumps them up to 10 to 12 pounds. When I was growing up as a younger man, um, we used to, we used to like go to swap meets and garage sales or Home Depot and buy a half inch galvanized chain and put a couple feet of galvanized chain inside the hoop. Um, I like, you know, five to eight pounds. That's really good. Or find some old, some old weights from like a bench press setup. Drop that down in there with some zip ties. I'm like I said, five to eight pounds. But we actually, if we're hooping anything less than 30 or 40 feet, we don't weigh them down at all. Excellent. Uh, Greg's chiming in. What's going on, Greg? He's okay. asking, where do you like to hoop in the LBZ area? So um, I'm going to pull up the Navionics app in about 20 minutes, and I'm going to talk about it. But for those of you guys that are starting out, I like to recommend that zone between like, you know, the, the Davies, Los Alamitos, Jetties, across the entire uh, LA, Long Beach Harbor, all the way down to like Cabrillo Launch. That entire harbor is filled with so much structure. You, you could never fish every bit of structure in your lifetime. You have the entire break wall. You have all the oil islands. You have all the other little break walls that are down within the inner harbor. Uh, so I recommend those waters within the federal break wall. Because you got to remember that break wall is like seven and a half miles long from Cabrillo area all the way down to Huntington Beach area. So seven and a half miles, I mean, you do the math. That's like... 35, 40,000 feet of break wall on both the inside and the outside. So we like to recommend starting inside the harbor. 
Excellent, excellent. Uh, I think you uh, you already mentioned this, but uh, I'll ask it again. Uh, Jim wants to know, do you put weight on the tag end of the line and how much? Yeah, so on that tag end, uh, like I said, you know, Chromar makes a really awesome product. That's just a little clip, it goes on your end. But I take 12 to 16 ounce torpedoes and I just flip that, you know, we, we, this is our style. We use all the extra line, it's like 30 feet of line here. We kind of integrate this. It's our own style, but most guys just kind of, you know, leave their tag into the line and just do a single 12 to 16 ounce torpedo with a zip tie, double zip tie. Chris, you're muted, brother. I can't Sorry, hear you. Man. Sorry, that's the first time I've done that. Um, uh, I know we're going to go into uh, Navionics in a little bit, but Carrie wants to know, do you have any recommendations for Mission Bay in San Diego? Uh, we do. Um, if you really want to know some spots in Mission Bay, I highly recommend checking out your, your saltwaterguide.com. Uh, Dave, Captain Dave Hansen has a service. It's like five bucks a month. And he has a whole series of lobster videos where he goes over all the different areas of Mission. But if I were to be given the choice to hoop in Mission Bay or the Big Bay, I would absolutely go fish down to San Diego Bay. There's so much more structure and I've just, I've had more luck down there, but you can, you can hoop that in Mission. If you want to talk about it privately, tell, uh, tell her she can, him or her, they can send us a DM. They can reach out to Dave Hansen. We'll hook them up. Cool. Cool, man. Um, Robert, how's it going, Robert? He says, any good coastal hooping along the Port Wainimi, Oxnard, and Ventura coastlines? You know, the furthest that I personally ever hoop netted has been like Marina del Rey, Santa Monica area. But um, towards the latter part of this presentation, when we pull up the Navionics app, we'll look at it together and we'll find some rock structure closer to that area that's not very far at all. Um, if you're brave enough to, to go beyond break walls and hoop net, in the surge and in the swell and in the waves and all that. Then we'll talk about some spots towards the end when we pull up Navionics. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent, man. Well, uh, I think you've already, you kind of uh, present or have a uh, presentation for us, right? I have. Like, there's a couple, a couple other things that I want to yeah. go over. Um, just some of the more, some of the other equipment that's, that's super, super critical to have on board. We've talked about the floats. We talked about this, uh, the masking tape to, to label your floats. We talked about the zip ties. It's always a good idea to have a big old bag of zip ties and some nice sharp dikes for taking care of everything. Don't forget a measuring device for every single angler on board. We also recommend gloves for everybody for when you're cutting up bait, for when you're retrieving lines. Gloves are really good to have. We love, love, love Chromar LED lights. Hold on, I'm going to admit Eddie there. Uh, we also recommend a spotlight for spotting up ahead when you're hanging over the bow of your boat, looking for those um, for those floats coming up. We like to wrap all of our floats in Department of Transportation reflective tape because if you don't have a light for the night, you can still hit these reflective tapes on your floats up with a light, and these things will shine for like half a mile. And last but not least, we also recommend having some kind of attractant. We are super partial to the bite on lobster attractant. It's like over 90% of pure salmon oil. And this stuff is amazing. If you take some fresh mackerel or fresh sardines and mix it up and put a little dab of this in there, you're just going to increase that scent dispersion. So some of the equipment you want to have on board, we also rec recommend having a gaff on board so you can pull up next to your floats and reach over and not have to you know, pull up perfectly next to those floats. We recommend having a sabiki rod from Promar so that you can continue to catch fresh mackerel all night long. But probably the biggest thing we recommend is dressing warm. You and I both know that lobsters crawl after the sun goes down. And during January through March, sometimes out there, it's in the 40s in our local base. Big old heavy jacket, some PVC, some plastic bibs, some big old boots, stay warm. If you're not warm, you're gonna have a miserable night. Lobster hooping is wet, but if you stay warm, you're good to go. Um, no kidding. I also wanna talk just a little bit about the techniques. And if, if, if now's the time, Chris, I want to talk a little bit about the, the time of soaking and how to adapt your, your, your hoop netting to the, the currents and to the wind and to the swell and all that. So, you know, a lot of new lobster hoopers, including myself, you take your hoops, you pull up next to some kind of rock wall or some kind of pylon that just looks fishy, you drop it in, you hope for the best. Probably what about 80, 90% of us do, and we have good luck. 
But if you really, 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 really want to increase your chances of getting those bugs, you have to pay attention to the incoming and the outcoming tide, and you have to pay attention to that current. One of the things that we do when we pull up to a spot, especially when we're outside the break wall, is we pay close attention to the kelp line. If you pull up to a kelp line, no matter where you are, from Central Cal all the way down to the border, you know, there used to be this massive kelp line that started in like Santa Monica and just basically traveled down the entire coastline all the way into Mexico. But now we have these chunks of kelp. One of the spots that we like is Palos Verdes. When we pull up to the kelp line, we look to see which way that kelp is laying. If you take a look at the way the kelp is laying, you can see which way the current is coming through that structure. So you want to set your hoops up on the, the upside or, or what I, you know, like the pre kelp side where it's going to, that water and that current is going to travel through your bait cage and disperse that scent, disperse that blood, disperse that oil into the kelp, into the structure. If we just drop it down randomly on the kelp line, if you have like a downhill current that's pulling offshore, all of your attractant and all of your oils and all those electromagnetic fields are going to be wasted. You want everything to run in the structure. So one of the things I like to tell people who are just learning how to hoop net, start on any break wall. Pull up to the break wall. Take a look at which way the kelp is lying. If there's no kelp on that break wall, we drop down a sabiki rig. Sometimes I've even tied on like a piece of red yarn. Drop it down and take a look at the way that yarn is facing underwater. You can tell which way the current is rushing and you can tell where to set your hoops down so that it's pulling that scent into the structure. One of the things that's critical to remember is that lobsters and crabs, they're scavengers. They're in the, the decomposer family. They're looking for, for dead and dying animals in the water. And so a lot of people think that lobsters are mostly attracted to like a blood scent or an oil scent or an attractive scent. And while they are attracted to that, those long antenna that they have on the California spiny lobster, those are receptors for what we call electromagnetic fields. Every single living thing on earth, whether it's a human or a dying calico bass or a dying octopus, they emit a very small amount of not only magnetic field, but electronic field. And if they're dying, they're emitting that field. And just like the lateral line on a game fish picks up that field, lobsters pick it up too. And that's why we promote using fresh bait. If you take a brand new mackerel and you cut it into thirds and throw it in that box, it's going to emit those electromagnetic fields for like 20 minutes. That's why we recommend that. Um, Chris, I'm going to talk real quick about bycatch and then we'll open it up to some questions before we talk about the Navionics app. You good with that? Sounds good to me, man. Go for it. All right. So bycatch, this is something that I learned from Jeff, from LP, but you know, if you, if you don't have your commercial license, and you're just Joe Schmo out there with your California report card, there's only really a few things that you're able actually to keep out of that hoop net. You can keep your lobster as long as they're legal, three and a quarter inches. You can keep your rock crabs and your other crabs that crawl in there. But other than that, any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, I think they're called Kellis Welk, those little crawling conches, any fish, any, anything else that crawls in there is considered an illegal bycatch and you have to throw it down. I'll admit I've kept some octopus over the years before I learned the regulations. Those bycatches are illegal unless it's a crab or unless it's a lobster. So pay close attention to that. You don't want to get yourself a fine. You don't want to have your boat taken. You don't want to have your equipment taken. And I also want to talk, I want to go back and talk about time of soak because my favorite time to get those hoops first dropped in that water is about 20 minutes before sunset. Lately, we've been dropping down around 4, 30, 5 o'clock because you have to remember that all the structure inside anywhere in the harbor, outside the harbor, has a shadow side and has a light side. If that sun's going down, that shadow side is going to be pretty prominent already even before the sun's down. So drop down at 4, 30, or 5, check at 5 o'clock. If, if the area is dead, move to a different depth, move to a different area, start early. The way you can get five, six, seven sets done by the time midnight comes around, and you're not, you know, starting to drop around seven or eight at night. So, I need some, I need some beverage. So, any questions, Chris? 
<laughs> Sounds good to me, man. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions here. Uh, Jim wants to know what is the best tide for a good crawl, and does a full moon hurt bugging? So this is all opinion based. I know there's a lot of guys that follow follow the moon phases, follow like the waxing and the waning gibbous and the crescent stages and the full and the new. I think that it pertains more to tidal movement, in my opinion. Uh, you got to remember that these lobster are hiding in these deep, deep, dark crevices of rock and structure. And when there's a strong incoming tide, there's all kinds of particulates rushing by their structure. When you have a dead or a slack tide, that current is not running as much with the incoming, the outcoming tide, and it's a little bit more stagnant. Outgoing tides are good too, but if you want my recommendation, find the time of the evening where your incoming tide starts all the way until your slack tide. And one of the best ways to do that is just Google the keywords of wherever you're lobster hooping. So if you're gonna hoop in Dana Point, just type in Dana Point tide charts or Long Beach Inner Harbor tide charts, uh, tide, tide charts, and it'll tell you what time that tide starts to come in. I personally don't pay any, any attention to the moon phases, but if you have a deep question about that, there's plenty of other anglers out there that think differently than myself. Right on, man. Uh, Wayne actually puts a, a good point. Put a key float on the measuring device just to be safe. Say that again? Uh, so we've got a, a recommendation from Wayne. Put a key float on the measuring device just to be safe. Smart man. So yeah. all these floats have a little, uh, that's really smart, I'm gonna do that. So just attach a little you know, $1 float from Walmart. So if this thing gets kicked over the side, you're not gonna get a, not gonna have a bad night if DFG rolls around. That's a great yep. suggestion. Is that Wayne? Yep, yep. Wayne's the man. What's up, Wayne? <laughs> yep. What's Lori's got, checking man? in. How's it going, Lori? She says, I love my Sabiki rod. You can travel with it well. Absolutely. And this is why she says you can travel with it well, because the Promar Sabiki rods break down into three pieces. I don't know about you, but this fits in anyone's boat hidden. All right. But I like to keep ours set up with that Sabiki ready to go. Good point, whoever that was. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, David, I'm sorry. Carrie has a good question. Is there a certain distance you should be away from other traps asking for both strategy for catching and as far as angler courtesy? For me, it just comes down to courtesy. Um, I, I use kind of an eyeball technique. If I, if I see somebody's last float, and this is exactly what we recommend to our renters too. When you see the end of their set line, you want to give yourself kind of the same distance that you give a sport boat, casting distance, whether that's 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 feet. If you drop down and you're within casting distance of someone else's float, that's just rude. You're going to get called out on. They're going to take pictures of your vessel. We're going to put you on blast on social media. We're going to talk about your mom. Stay away. I like to recommend casting distance. Um, I don't think there's really a strategy to it because, I mean, I don't see any data behind that, but it's just a courtesy. It's a gentleman and a gentle lady thing. Excellent. Excellent, man. Uh, Jim wants to know, can the current be too strong for good hooping? Yeah. Um, if you don't, if you don't weigh your hoop nets down, sometimes current is ripping so much that it will take a hoop net that might be resting against some structure. It'll flip it over. It'll drag it along the floor. It'll sandwich it inside, you know, the, the jetty walls and you'll lose it. Um, I've never really experienced a rushing current like that, but I know a lot of guys that like to go out hooping after the rain when they have a lot of those channels just rushing fresh water in, in addition to an outgoing tide, sometimes those currents are insane and you've got to be really careful where you place your hoop nets if you don't want them to get shoved into some structure, it's a really good question. Excellent. And guys, as a reminder, for those of you watching, if you have a question for Ryan or for me, uh, make sure to put them in the comments below. We'd love to answer them. Uh, Jim has another question. How do you deal with a net line wrapped in your prop? All right. So for me, it's a simple process. I'm just going to be honest. Bring a good knife with you and bring a pair of swimming trunks. When you, as soon as you realize that that prop is caught, the first thing you wanna do is turn off the motor and throw out the anchor. 
one of the reasons why we recommend throwing out the anchor because if your prop is gone and you don't have a trolling motor, you're going to start drifting with the wind and the current, and it's very dangerous. You can get shoved up against a brake wall. I've seen plenty of guys lose outboards, get holes in their hole, blah, blah, blah. So turn off the motor, throw out that anchor, and designate someone on your boat. Hey, you're the anchor guy. You need to make sure that anchor's holding. Once that anchor has started holding, bring the trim up on your outboard, because most of us are rocking outboards. Bring that trim up. If you can reach it by hanging over there with a knife and cutting it off, better. But there's been plenty of nights where I, myself and friends that I've known have jumped in 53 degree water, get that knife, cut out that prop, then bring the trim back down and save yourself. I would like to suggest bringing a, you know, a wetsuit or a pair of trunks and a life vest and doing it yourself with a knife. Otherwise you're calling boat tow, you're calling sea tow, you're calling the fire department and your night is done. Not that much work to get in there and cut that off. That's, uh, that's some really good points there. Um, here's a kind of a question that I have, you know, if you end up, you know, God forbid you lose some gear or something like that. Are there any steps that you need to take in terms of reporting that lost gear or anything like that? So, you know, one of the things that we like to recommend to all hoop netters, in addition to your goal ID, make sure that your phone number is on the hoop. Sometimes, you know, most of the time people lose their nets because they don't leave themselves enough line for the incoming tide. And they're, they're hooping in 35 feet. And there's an incoming tide, and next thing you know, there's an eight foot difference, and now their float is six feet underwater. If you, if you take the time to label your floats with your name and your phone number, if someone comes along that, it's usually pretty obvious when a, when a hoop net setup has been abandoned, someone's gonna give you a call. If DFG, and I've seen them, if they go around collecting, or if a diver collects and they turn them in, they're gonna contact the go ID or they're gonna contact the phone number. I've been contacted before by both DFG and by local anglers. Um, I'm not saying DFG is going to give a crap and they're going to do anything about it, but throw your phone number on there. Really, in addition to your go ID. Excellent. Awesome, man. I think that about does it with uh, questions there for right now. Oh, we got one comment from Greg. Can't wait for the next part with Navionics, learning the secret spots of Ryan. I'm not going to give you my <laughs> secret spots. <laughs> Uh, but what I am actually going to do, um, uh, I want to talk about really quick the reason why hoop netting after the rain is so awesome. And I want to talk real, real quick about strategy when you're hooping from piers, because there's a lot of us out there that don't have a boat or don't have a buddy with a boat. And we just want to go out to the piers and drop some, some hoops down, you know, relax, have a cold beer, hang out with the family, interact with the people on the pier. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about that rain. So after a rain, during a rain, whatever it is, crustaceans, lobsters, whatever you want to call them, they hate fresh water. Crustaceans, lobsters that are relating to a type of structure, I'm especially thinking of the massive amount of fresh water that comes into Dana Point, right around Salt Creek area. Salt Creek, that whole area kind of by, you know, by the hotel, kind of to the point, over by Dana Point, it's really popular for lobster hooping. There's a lot of rock structure down there. There's a lot of vertical kelp stocks. But during the rain, when all that fresh water is rushing in, whether it's there or it's the Santa Ana area or it's the inner Long Beach Harbor over by Queen Mary, they want to get away from that fresh water. So whatever structure they're relating to, they're going to go to the opposite side of that area. For example, the oil islands. There are lobster around the oil islands. Everyone knows that. Hopefully none of you guys are getting mad that I'm putting the oil islands on blast in Long Beach Harbor. But that fresh water that comes in near Queen Mary, it's pushing that fresh water into the bay. And those lobsters are going to try to get on the opposite side of that oil island where the water is more saline, more, uh, got more salt contact, con uh, more salt content. Whereas fresh water, they want to get away from it. That's why so many people like to fish and lobster hoop during and after the rain, because they can kind of predict that the lobsters have moved to the opposite side of the structure. Um, in addition to that, for those of you guys that are going to drop hoops down at the local piers and jetties, pay attention to the way in which the swell is coming and the way in which the current's taking you. If you drop one of your hoops down against a pylon and the current's kind of running like uphill and kind of offshore a little bit, then it's going to take all of that electromagnetic signal and all of that scent and it's going to disperse it into the ocean or into the breaking waves. 
pay attention to the way in which it's coming so that you can drop your hoop down on the side of the pier where it's going to bring your scent into the pylon underneath the pier. And don't forget, when you drop down at the pier, you don't have to have a hoop. Excuse me. You don't have to have a float. You don't need to have an LED light. You don't need any tag or anything like that. A lot of guys just drop down and then they tie off to their chair or they tie off to the wood. You just got to be careful because there's some local municipal codes, especially out in Huntington Beach, that prohibit using the rail as an assistant when you're pulling up your line. There's all kinds of weird rules, but just keep in mind, pay attention to that swell and to that current. And then also just know that you're only allowed to have two devices on any of our piers. So if you've got a, a single hoop net, you can be fishing with one rod. If you've got two hoops in, you can't be fishing. You're only allowed to have two devices here in Southern California at a time. That's very good to know. Um, Joe actually has a thought and a question. I did well fishing shallow 20, 35 feet early in the season. Haven't been in a few months. Should I start to fish deeper now that it is later in the season? No, that, that gentleman, you missed the beginning of the presentation. This is the end of the season. This is spawn season. They're in the shallows. Um, I'm sorry if I'm you know, sharing secret ancient knowledge from our Aztec brothers, but it's shallow season now. We're hooping like 25 to five feet right now. Excellent, excellent. Whether it's Catalina, LA County, Orange County, San Diego County. Awesome, man, sounds good. All right, so what I'm gonna do, if there's no questions right now, I'm gonna join this Zoom on my phone. I am going to have you um, accept me and then I'm gonna share my screen if you, uh, if you can help me with that. And I'm gonna show you guys the Navionics app. Give me one sec here. You're good. Oh, you need to unmute yourself. All right. Do we have a, can you guys hear me okay? We got you good. All right, I'm gonna, all right. Any feedback, are we good? Still echoing, hold on. All right, we should be good now. All right, so I'm gonna open up my Navionics app and then I need somebody to give me some feedback here. If you can see, I need to be made host. Uh, Chris, can you make that Candelaria last name that just signed in a host real quick? Right on, here we go. All right, I'm sharing my whole screen, so hopefully, uh, hopefully my wife doesn't send me a booty call or anything right now. All right, I don't have any audio at the moment, so I am gonna just hope that you guys are paying attention and listening. Let me go back to my Zoom. Give me about 10 more seconds. All right, so here we have the Navionics app. I'm gonna go back and show you what it looks like on my screen. All right, here it is on the right-hand side right next to Bandcamp, right above Geico Mobile. So this Navionics app. All right, and what we're looking at here is the standard app that people have been using for like 15 years. Right now, we're looking at our Southern California bike from the Channel Islands all the way down to San Diego. And you can see how on this Navionics app, which is free, by the way, you could see how part of this map is lighter than the other. So I'm gonna zoom in to, uh, Let's zoom into Malibu area. And you can see right when I get to a certain point, the map changes and all these beautiful colors show up. And if I zoom in even more to the Malibu area, you can see that I start picking up some rock structure. So here we have some rock structure that's around 200 feet. If I go closer to the coastline, there you can see some rock structure right here around 27 something feet, 26 feet. What this, new layer on Navionics is called, I think it's like 12 bucks a year, but on the bottom left of the screen under the layer button, there's a, a, a new layer 
that's highlighted on the bottom called relief shading. If I take off that relief shading app, you can see that my Navionics screen then turns boring. But if I turn on the relief shading app, you can see that now we have crystal clear pictures of the rock structure. So for example, here in Malibu, if you zoom into Point Doom area, you can see this whole rock structure that's right here, right off of the point. And you wouldn't normally know that these rocks are here unless you have this app. There's no other app out there right now that have this kind of definition. So here's some rock structure that you could use in, in you know, as you're cruising through with your, your navigation on your sonar. And you can see here as I zoom out, as you go up and down the coastline, all this rock structure just appears that you may not have known there before. So here we are right off of, um, right smack in the middle of the bay. And here's some rock structure in about 30 feet of water that you would not have known about if you didn't have Navionics. So somebody earlier was asking about structure up near the uh, Channel Islands area. And I don't have my map activated that, but I'm gonna go to Point Magoo and I'm gonna zoom into the shallows in Point Magoo. And pull a random rock up here. No, oh, here we go. Here's some rock structure right here. And I'm gonna add my marker to the rock structure here. And you can see, I'm gonna hit question mark. And it shows me right there, North 34, 5769, West 119, 7548. So there right there is a brand new set of rock structure that I pulled up here in a matter of moments on the Navionics app. So I'm gonna stop my, brief, my uh, broadcasting. I'm gonna bring this back. All right, Chris, did you hear everything I just said or am I crazy? We got you, man. That was awesome. Go ahead, dude. No, that was awesome, man. We got you. So for those of you guys that are paying attention, it's simple. Go to the iOS or go to Google Play, go to the App Store, find the Navionics app. I think it's called Boating. Pay the extra 12, 13 bucks a year and get access to that extra layer called relief shading. It's gonna change the way that you lobster hoop. You're gonna find rock structure and artificial structure that you never knew was there before. It's not on any charts. It's not on fish dope. It's not on your saltwater guide. It's you're finding it yourself. There's a question. That was amazeballs. Yeah, Albert, it is pretty amazeballs. Check it out, dude. Any other questions about California spiny lobster? before we switch over to talk about some of the rockfish changes? Uh, not questions, but a comment. Carrie says, very cool. We will use that for kayak fishing too. All right, Carrie. Well then Chris, I'm gonna end up, uh, I'm gonna end off on broadcasting this cheesy little PowerPoint here, if you're ready to go. Let's do it, man. It's all you. All right, so let me go back here to the beginning. So just some real simple changes to the Southern management area here in Southern California. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, when I say Southern management area, I mean Point Conception, which is the uh, Gaviota area, all the way down to the border. Some of the things to keep in mind is that we still are able to have two lean cods per angler per day. That is awesome. That's a change a couple years ago. Sculpin, as of I think 2019 or 2020, are still open all year long. That is awesome, minimum 10 inches. Uh, here's the big, the big one. Last year, they increased the depth of rock fishing to 450 feet. Everyone was stoked. This year, they dropped it down to 600 feet. The data that all the agencies in California, the data they've been collecting is showing that the stocks are up and that these fish are in abundance. However, the cow cod areas are still 240 feet. There's a massive cow cod area between Catalina Island and the Channel Islands all the way out to San Nick. There's a massive area even further out towards the Tanner and the Cortez. And then there's another uh, protected zone down in San Diego uh, between uh, La Jolla and Clemente. You can see it on the map here. You're still only limited to 240 feet at those sections. Every other area for those of us that fish coastal, it's to 600 feet. However, this is the thing that stinks big time. And this, a lot of you guys don't even know this yet. 
you're no longer allowed to keep a limit of 10 reds, whether you call them red snappers or reds or big reds or vermilion. Per day, each angler is only allowed to have five now. You can still have your complete limit of rockfish, but only five of them can be vermilion. That stinks. Um, we've been used to this for a while now. There's still zero take of bronze spotted cow cod and yellow eye. No take of those at all. I want to talk a little bit about sculpin. I know that we still have, you know, we still got about three weeks left in the sculpin season because ground fish are closed right now. But, you know, sculpin live in that, you know, they live in the break walls. They live in the jetty walls. They live all the way down to about two, 250 feet. Anytime you find rock structure in the 100 foot to 200 foot zone, drop down what we call that knocker rig, which is that swim bait head with a couple sliding egg sinkers, drop down the dropper loop where your, uh, your bottom loop, uh, instead of having a loop, you have that big old sawash or that big old J hook hooked up to your torpedo. Uh, squid strips, sculpin are year round, they're easy to catch. Um, some other tips to kind of share with you, don't forget to have a descending vise above your kayaks and, or excuse me, on board your kayaks and on board your boats. Uh, you don't have to worry about link hods and sculpin because they don't have the whole air, air batter thing, but all of those other little rockfish that you're catching, drop them back down. Use circle hooks. I guarantee you the majority of us are not going to be dropping down 450, 600 feet for these rockfish. We're still going to be fishing 100 to 300 feet. Really, do you really want to grind on your reel to bring two dropper loops up 600 feet when I grew up, I remember we used to rock fish with like 10 to 15 setups, uh, dropper loops on one line. Do you really want to drop down 400 to 600 feet and retrieve for four and a half minutes unless you have an electric reel? Just some things to think about. All right. And don't forget Slay Day. You know, we have, we have boats available in LA and Orange County. We have some big announcements coming up here very soon about our San Diego, what we're calling Slay Day Southtown. That's still all in the works. But if you ever want to get out on your own boat, or you ever want to, uh, you know, take take your own crew out and try something different? Give us a holler. We'd love to have you out on one of our boats. Excellent, man. That's awesome. Uh, just a couple more comments. Day or Wayne says that's awesome. Going to help with uh, fishing too, assuming the uh, the Naviomics app. Yep. Uh, Dave says great info. That's awesome. A lot of people. Robert says thanks for the Naviomics search tip. Todd says rocking it, man. Uh, Jim points out, uh, yeah, but you can actually catch 10 canaries now. Okay. Yep. Um, I was unaware of that. Uh, that's interesting. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up. I'm going to have to check that out. Thanks, man. Uh, Joe wants to know, will the full video be posted anywhere? I missed the first 10 minutes. So there's a couple of things going on. I know that CCA is going to have it archived on their Facebook page. I know that Chris is helping us out with some, uh, some, some uh, screen grabbing and we're going to flip this. Uh, we're going to export it, have it available on our website, have it available on our YouTube channel. I'm sure CCA will have it available on their media too. So yes, it'll be there forever. Absolutely. Greg wants to know, do you think like electric reels like the Daiwa Tanacom 500 will be more beneficial with the increase in depth of fishing to 600? My opinion is there are going to be some giant giant rockfish between the 450 and the 600 feet zone that have been untouched for a while now. And if you're willing to use that electric reel, I don't see why, I mean, shoot, if I had one, I'd be dropping down whole squids on dropper loops down to 600 feet to those rock structures. Who knows what kind of behemoths are down there. There might be a new California record for a red or a new California record for a Boccaccio. If you have one, do it. If you don't have one, why would you spend that money? Go catch the same fish at 400 feet. It's just my opinion. <laughs> right on, man. Uh, Robert wants to know, I think we already addressed this, but what weights do you use on your buoy? So I like to use the 5 8 inch by one and a half inch galvanized uh, bolt, threaded bolt. So Lowe's, Home Depot, right here. Again, I like to use five eighths inch by one and a half inch. They're pretty heavy. We usually put about three or four here. In this one, we have a couple sliding weights in there. And we always throw them in with some silicone so that they stay nice and balanced with your light on top and your weights on the bottom. 
So this right here, normally on our floats, we have three or four of those galvanized uh, lug bolts or whatever they're called. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Wayne actually dropped a link to SlayDaySoCal.com right in the comments there. So make sure you go check out Ryan and his, and his crew. Uh, Kerry says, look forward to Slay Day. Friend of mine went on on one of your boats last year and loved it. Cool. Be happy to have you, man. Give us a call if you ever have any questions. Yep, yep. Jeff, uh, Jeff from LP says, thanks, Ryan. Hey, Jeff, I'll see you on Saturday, man. We're going to limit out for your birthday, bro. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I can't thank you enough, man, for being here. This was super, super awesome. One more time, man. How do we get a hold of you? How do we uh, get to go fishing with you? If you want to take out one of our boats or if you want to check out one of our private charters, uh, just go ahead and check out SlaydaySoCal.com. Check out SlaydaySoCal on Instagram, on Facebook, or SlaydaySoCal at gmail.com. But uh, if you just hop to our website, everything's there. We have, you can book online from your phone. You can download all of our guides. We have about 15 different videos on there. We have links to all these different websites. We are, uh, we're in, uh, we're pretty steady contributor to Fish Dope through a Bloody Deck. So just check out our website and give us a holler if you have any questions. Yep. And uh, one last uh, tidbit of info. Um, CCA Cal is working to open Cal Cod for fishing, hopefully soon. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome, man. Best well, news I've heard. Yep. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for being here. I can't thank you enough, dude. Thank you so much. All right. Strong work on the info. Kudos. Thanks, Eddie. I'll catch you on the flip side. Bye, guys. Awesome. And we will see you guys next week. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and uh, take care.